it's not something that happened a long time ago, and we might as well forget it. No, it's telling us that when God offered us a minor angel accompaniment, we were not interested. Uh, we've spoken about this many times, that uh, every story in the Torah, every story in the Bible, is a divine revelation. Not an ordinary story, not a common story, not a uh, predictable story. It's a revelation of some divine wisdom, not certainly of pop psychology. So when a story seems to be a little too ordinary, we got to think twice. We got to re-examine, dig deeper, find some commentary, because this needs to be explained. We also have to pay attention to the grammar, to the tenses, because everything in the Torah is perfect and purposeful. So present, past, future, we, they, us, we got to pay attention to these things because there is so much more to the words when we understand them properly than at first glance. So let's talk about one of the most famous stories in the, uh, in the Torah, and that is the making of the golden calf. The Jews are standing at the foot of Mount Sinai. God comes down to the mountain and proclaims ten commandments and then gives Moses, Moshe, who is up on the mountain, uh, the commandments in writing engraved in a precious stone or two stones. Where did this golden calf come from? How is it possible that they hear from God himself, you shall make no graven images, and then 40 days later, they're worshiping a golden calf? How is that possible? And the ordinary conventional explanations don't hold water. Because it shouldn't be possible. So let's take a look at the wording of the story. Moshe says to the people, I'm going up to the mountain. I'm going to be there for 40 days. And on the 40th day before noon, I will return. On the 39th day, the people expected Moshe to show up because they assumed that the day that Moshe told them that it's going to be 40 days was day number one. But it wasn't because part of that day had already passed. And when Moshe said 40 days, he meant 40 complete days. So the 40 days began the night, because the night precedes the day. So the 40 days began the night after Moshe told them that he would be back in 40 days. So they misunderstood, they miscalculated, and they said, this man, Moshe, we don't know what happened to him. Looks like he's not coming back. So we need a replacement, a substitute, a substitute for Moshe, some leader, some indicator as to how we should travel, when we should travel, how do we get to Israel, which is where they were headed. Now the people approach Aaron. Moshe's brother. And they say, we need a substitute for Moshe. Aaron says, you got gold? 
and they immediately handed all their gold over to Aaron. Aaron throws it into the fire and out comes a golden calf. Nobody carved it. Nobody created it. They threw the gold into the fire and a calf shows up. And then the people said, This is your God, O Israel, who took you out of Egypt. So there are a few things we need to understand here. They started off saying we need a substitute for Moshe. So whatever they were going to create was going to be a a leader, a compass that will guide them in their journey. But then the golden calf comes out And all of a sudden they're saying, ah, this is your God who took you out of Egypt. That was not the plan. The plan was not to find a substitute God. The plan was to find a substitute for Moshe. So what happened? Number two, who's talking? Who is saying to whom, this is your God, Israel, who took you out of Egypt? Your God. If all the people were doing this, then who is speaking to whom? It should be, this is our God. We also find that after Moshe comes down off the mountain and he breaks the tablets, throws them down, and he says, whoever is still loyal to God, follow me. And the entire tribe of Levi the Levite, all joined him, which means at least one entire tribe did not partake or participate in this, in this plan. So it wasn't the entire people. But who said to whom, this is your God? And what does it mean that they threw the gold into the fire and out came a golden calf? How did that happen? What was Aaron's thinking? Certainly, Aaron was not about to participate in anything idolatrous in any way at all, not even peripherally. So what is he saying? Give me the gold and I'll make make an idol for you? So the entire story begs for commentary, uh, background, illumination, what in the world is going on. So if we read carefully, Moshe is on the mountain, and God suddenly says to Moshe, go down. You have to descend, not only off the mountain, but from the exalted position you're in. You've lost that position because you represented a great people. Now the people are not so great, so neither are you. A great leader gets his greatness from the people. He's not greater than the people. So when the people go down, the leader goes down. So God says, you have just descended You've just lost your lofty position because, because the, your people who you brought out of Egypt have messed up and they've created a graven image. Kind of strange for God to say your people who you took out of Egypt when it was God who performed the, the, the plagues, who brought the plagues and all the miracles, and it's God's people. How many times did Moshe say to Pharaoh, so says the God of Israel, let my people go. But now they mess up, and all of a sudden it's not his people, it's Moshe's people. And Moshe brought them out of Egypt. So we find out 
that when the Jews left Egypt, a great multitude of Egyptians joined them. What was this great multitude? That's a little redundant, isn't it? Multitude means great and great means multitude. The people who joined the Jews were the sorcerers, the advisors, the magicians, the elite among Pharaoh's people. So it was many of them, and they were great in stature in Egypt. Moshe did not ask God whether they were welcome to join or not. He assumed it's a good thing. Somebody wants to get closer to God, why not? Problem is that it turned out that they were not sincere about God. They wanted to join the Jewish people because the Jewish people were the victors. You always go with the winner. Egypt was down. Egypt was destroyed. So they figured, why go down with the ship? Let's join the victorious Jews and uh, share in their success. They were not interested in the God of Israel. So God says to Moshe, the people you brought, he wasn't talking about the Jewish people. He was talking about the multitude, the riffraff, which is really a Hebrew term, Erev Rav, the riffraff that you brought without asking me, you invited them to join. Well, they messed up. And they made a graven image. How did they do it? They were sorcerers. They used their magic and they turned the gold into a calf. That's what it means. Their original feeling that the people had, the Jewish people, was we need a substitute for Moshe. But that's not what the riffraff were thinking. They were thinking, we can, we can become heroes now and we can become leaders and advisors to the Jewish people if we show them what we can do. And we can give them other gods, which is another interesting thing. If you look at the words carefully, after the golden calf came out of the fire, somebody said to somebody, these are your gods, plural. There was only one calf. And yet they said these, gods. Because that was just the beginning of their plan. Their plan was to introduce many gods just as it was in Egypt. There's an interesting comment, commentary. Why a calf? They could have made anything out of that gold. Magically, naturally, manually. Why a calf? In the blessings that, J that Jacob, Yaakov, gives his children, he refers to many of them as having the qualities of a certain animal. Yehuda was a lion. Joseph, who was the hero of Egypt, is described as an ox, the strength of an ox. So it was in their mind that if they want to introduce a god to the Jewish people, they should use a Jewish theme, a popular Jewish theme. And so they turned it into a calf because it was reminiscent of Joseph. So every word, every detail of the story is, is meaningful. So what happens? The riffraff decide to change the agenda from a substitute for Moshe to a substitute for God. 
And that's why they said to the Jewish people, these are your gods who took you out of Egypt. They had to convince the Jews because that was not what the Jews originally were asking for. They were looking for a substitute for Moshe. Now, what happened to Aaron? Aaron's thinking was, this is not idolatry. They're looking for a substitute for Moshe. So all I have to do is delay them a little bit. Moshe is coming tomorrow morning, and it'll all be over. The problem will be gone. So the first thing he says was, do you have any gold? Figuring they won't part with their gold so quickly. To his surprise and dismay, they immediately offered the gold. So he said, I need the gold of your wives and children's jewelry. Thinking they won't let their gold be taken. And that will delay things and so on. Then he said to them, let me do this. Let me create whatever it is we need to create. It sounded like he was volunteering to do the work. What he was really saying was, if we all chip in, it'll happen too quickly. Let me do it as a special project. That'll take me a while. And in the meantime, Moshe will show up. But if the agenda was idolatry, Aaron wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole, and the fact that people were, were violent and threatening would not have intimidated him. Because the one sin you should not commit, even if it's going to save your life, is idolatry. And murder and adultery. So Aaron was afraid that if he resisted and simply refused, they would kill him. What made him think that? His nephew, Miriam's son, Hur, the son of Kalev, he stood up against them and said, no way, this is not going to happen. And they killed him. So there was no doubt that they would kill Aaron too. So Aaron decided that he's going to play along. But he was playing along because it wasn't idolatry. When it became idolatry, it was too late. There was nothing Aaron could do. So when Moshe comes down off the mountain and he sees that there's a golden calf, he says to Aaron, what did they do to you? How did they get you to cooperate? Idolatry? So Aaron defends himself and says, no, they were confused about you, not about God. There was no need to sacrifice my life for that. But then it turned, and all of a sudden it was about idols. Another interesting thing was, Moshe comes down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments, with, with the tablets. Actually, let me, let me clarify this also. What does tablets mean? I think a tablet is a flat piece of wood or stone with some writings on it. These were not flat pieces of stone. First of all, they were sapphire. Secondly, they were cubes, not tablets. So they were very heavy. How do we know this? Well, because the ark that contained the stones, was built to perfect measurement. So if you look at the measurements of the ark, it wasn't built for tablets. It was built for 
cubes. I'm not sure what the measurements are in English, so I'm not even going to guess at it. But they must have been very heavy. So, Moshe carries the stones, the cubes, down from heaven, down from the top of the mountain. And when he sees the golden calf, he throws them to the foot of the mountain and they break. Why did he carry them down the mountain? While he was at the top of the mountain, God said, your people blew it. They made a graven image. So Moshe should have abandoned the stones right there. Don't even bring them down. Why bring them down and break them? Just don't bring them at all. The purpose in breaking the stones was that the stones were like the contract the formal agreement. God said orally, thou shalt have no other gods and make no graven images. But that was not necessarily binding. But when it came in writing, in etched in stone, that would be a binding commitment and then Jews would be unforgivable. So Moshe says, no, I'm not delivering this contract. We're not signing it. The, the deal is off because um, if he gave them the ten, if he gave them the, the, the written word, then there would be no forgiving them for the idolatry. So to save them, he broke the contract. But then the question is, he could have left it up at the top of the mountain and not deliver it at all. The sages who received this tradition from Moshe tell us that when Moshe heard God say the Jews made a golden calf or a graven image, he didn't believe it. He heard it from God and he didn't believe it. Because that's what a devoted leader does. He always argues in favor of the people. So even when God said they made a graven image, Moshe, Moshe said, no, that can't be. Maybe something like a graven image, but nah, not literally a graven image. People would never do that. That was his greatness. But when he saw the golden calf with his own eyes, then he had no choice but to cancel the contract. God actually appreciated and thanked him for doing that. That's the kind of leadership God wants for his people. So now the final question. Is that the end of the story? They made a golden calf. It was terrible. God was very angry. Moshe got got God to forgive them. That's it. Over. Done. Why do we need to know this? Something happened as a result that we do need to know. After they make, they make the golden calf, God said, I forgive them. I will not wipe them out. but we're not the same anymore. From now on, I will send an angel to guide you along your way. But I am not personally going to accompany you. The people could not accept this. After they repented and paid the price for their sin, they couldn't accept this. And Moshe comes back up the mountain and says to God, if you're coming with us, then let us go. If you're not coming with us, then what's the point of going? So an angel 
We're not interested in angels. We want you to come with us. We want to go with you. If you're not going, then we won't go either. So God said, okay, I'm coming with you. That we needed to know, and we need to know it today. Once God promised, I will be your personal guide, no substitute will ever come up again. So what we're being told, actually, is not that it once happened that the Jewish people looked for a substitute, for a minor God. It's not something that happened a long time ago, and we might as well forget it. No, it's telling us that when God offered us a minor angel accompaniment, we were not interested. And so God said, oh, so you do have a little devotion in you. So you do really want to be connected to me. In that case, I will be your personal uh, guide forever. And since then, it has never happened. In the worst times, and we've had some pretty harsh times, a golden calf has never happened again. We have become immune. It's God himself who sees us through the most difficult of times. And sometimes it's not obvious, like in the miracle of Purim. But there was no question in the minds of the Jews of that time that this was God being there for us yet again. So, the message, the lesson for us today from that story, so many beautiful messages. Aaron's good intentions to just delay Moshe not believing that the Jews would ever do something like that. God being moved by the people's devotion, saying, if that's how you feel about me, then that's how I will treat you. I will personally accompany you until the end when we're settled into the promised land forever. That's the rest of the story. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal. It's questions and answers. It's conversation. It's really relaxed. It's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program. There's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us. Take a look. Click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best, and join us for some enjoyable conversations.